If you have your Bibles, please get them open to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 is where we're going to be today. If you did not bring a Bible with you, we got your back. Uh, there's a black one in the seat back in front of you. You grab it and get to page 902. You're going to be right there with us in Mark chapter 14. Man, I'm so grateful and glad that you are here this morning. Uh, we have kind of a skeleton crew when it comes to our staff today. So many are out on vacations and trips and stuff. And so uh, you start to think, well, is anybody showing up? So I'm glad that you are here, all right? And uh, uh, we're just so grateful that you've taken the time to be here this morning and pray that the Lord's going to bless you for that. Before I jump into this message, there's a couple things I want to make mention of. And really, the first is just the table in the back and the table in the Welcome Center, right? If, if, if you could kind of stop by those and check those out, there's a lot of information there for you. Uh, there's two things that are more time sensitive. I want to mention every single one of them to you, but the two things that are more time sensitive have to do with our Panama trip and Student Life Camp. And so we have a team uh, get, getting ready to go to Panama at the end of this month uh, to support uh, David and Marinella, a couple of our mission partners down there, and do some good work there, some evangelism, some medical work, and other things. And uh, they have a list of needs, of uh, supplies they've been asked to bring. And so we're trying to see if anybody wants to take part and support that trip and pick up those supplies and drop them off. Uh, there's also a, a QR code that you can scan that gets them to an Amazon wish list. Or there's a green envelope if you just want to help pay for all the extra luggage they're going to have to take down to take that stuff. To the right of that, there's going to, you're going to find blue envelopes. I was supposed to mention this last week to you guys. I didn't, right? Uh, I remember in the 11 o'clock service, so I'm making up for it and mentioning this to you today. Um, God is doing something tremendous in our student ministries in which more than 50 students have signed up to go to Student Life Camp this year. Um, and so that is from 7th grade to 12th grade. Um, and that is an event that we invest in heavily every year, both in finances and resources and people, because every single time God shows up and does some amazing things. And so um, that's, that's kind of a keystone event for us. And um, I was driving uh, down Interstate 70 a couple weeks ago and just watching just how horrific drivers are on Interstate 70 and picturing taking nine, seven, eight, nine vehicles to camp, and it just didn't sit right with me. And so uh, we went ahead and have arranged for a large bus to come and take uh, them. So we only have to take two vehicles now. But that bus was not cheap. Um, and so we we're asking if anybody uh, would love to contribute to that and help us get our, all our teens and helpers to camp safely. Um, that's what we hope and pray for. Um, then there's a blue envelope in the back that helps contribute to that if you want to be a part of that. And so I want to mention both of those to you, a couple opportunities that even if you're not involved with those two things, uh, you can still be involved. And then uh, the week of camp, we're going to have prayer guides for you uh, go out every day so you can, you can stay actively engaged with what's going on with that. So um, yeah, really appreciate uh, your attentiveness to that. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer and then we'll jump into Mark chapter 14. Father, we are so incredibly grateful um, for uh, the opportunity that we have to gather today and um, to, just, to just be here, uh, to sing your praises, to, uh, to open up your word, to just, to just do what uh, might feel rhythmic or routine, but it is anything but, uh, because we're two or three gathered in your name, you promised to be there. And so we pray that you'll just bring this home now, uh, that you'll speak powerfully through your word and you'll get the glory from everything that's about to happen. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. The one thing I did forget to mention, it's Family Worship Sunday. So the kiddos are in here with us. And so anybody five years and up, uh, welcome. I know you'd like to be downstairs with Matt, uh, but you're up here with me. And so uh, we're glad that you're a part of it. Families, I hope you're enjoying that. And, uh, and all of you who work uh, with our children, I hope that you uh, enjoy this break that we give you once a quarter. And so thank you for your efforts down there. To Mark 14, there's been a couple times in my life that I've had the opportunity to take um, not only teams on mission trips to Berlin, Germany, but what I would call larger teams, right? Uh, and for the most part, it's been it, the scheduling and getting everybody there was really hard, but once you're on the ground, it's fun, it's easy, and it's fun to see the Lord work. But there was always a decision that carried uh, a good amount of weight to it. Because the groups that I led had uh, 12 and 15 people respectively. And so we couldn't rent cars, right? It was just too big a group. We had to take public transportation. Um, and with a group that size, trains are always easier than buses, right? Because just you had more, more availability to get large groups on. And so we took a lot of trains. And I uh, carried, it was, it was still, this was 2012 and 2015, so smartphones weren't advanced to the point where you could have an app to tell you where to go, so I just carried a paper map of the city with me everywhere I went. Uh, and it showed where different trains went around the city, 
And the only tricky part was we got on a lot of these trains underground, and you'd have to go through turns and hallways and stairs, and so you've lost all sense of direction by the time you get there. And trains were named after a line, not a direction. And so there'd be two trains in every line. So like the S25 goes north and south, and they both are just called the S25 train. And so a lot of times you're like, all right, now I've got to figure out which one I've got to get on. And the majority of the time it would be called S25 and then the last stop, right? And so S25 to Hindensdorf or Lichterfeld Oaks, and you're like, okay, that one's going north and that one's going south. But that didn't work all the time, Right? And so there would be multiple times I'd be in a station, and I knew that we needed, for, for instance, the U11 train, but I didn't know if we needed the U11 train on this track or this track. And I would be double-checking the map 20, 30, 40 times as the train got closer because I knew that once you got on the train, the train was not going to turn around for you, right? When you, if you choose a train, you're choosing where that thing is headed. And so I wanted to make sure before I loaded 15 people onto a train, it was actually headed the direction we wanted to go before we boarded and I wish that to you because too often in life, we make choices without, without making a similar consideration. But we don't take the time to realize that when we choose the beginning of a road, we are choosing where that road leads to. Where a young person chooses the wrong friends and the wrong influences in their lives. Or they start dating someone who is not wise to date. A man chooses a career path that will provide advancement in finances and career success, but no time for his family or his faith. If someone decides they need to sleep in more than having an unrushed time with the Lord in their, in, the, in their morning, or a couple agrees to a schedule for their family that leaves absolutely no margin to breathe or to be used by God for anything, and they do these things without ever thinking about where that decision or that path that they're starting on, where it's actually going to ultimately lead if you let it play out for, for a year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. And today in Mark, we're going to see a story that's actually going to teach us more about the people around Jesus than Jesus himself. And we're going to see that, that where they are is just the arrival. Like the, where they are in Mark 14 is the arrival of where they, the road of their choices has inevitably led them. They didn't get to this point overnight. They've been building there. And it's my prayer that God would use this story to show us that there are no little choices that we make. That it would heighten for us the need to utilize the gifts of confession and repentance and turn around that God has so graciously given us in Jesus. And I'm praying that, that in this place today, that God would identify really troubling trends in our lives that we could repent of before they become disasters that we could see the road we're on before we go too far down it. And so I'm going to invite Stacy Ingram up. She's going to be reading our passage this morning. She's going to be reading for us Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. And if you could please stand with her, if you're physically able, capable, to honor the reading of the Word of God this morning. This is also Stacy's first time reading, so thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Go. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so that there won't be a riot among the people. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her. Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for, you, for me. You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, 
one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were so glad and promised to give him money. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Thank you so much, Stacy. You guys can have a seat. As always, keep your Bibles open there to Mark chapter 14. That's the passage that we're going to be breaking down. And so let's, again, let's set the scene. We'd like to establish the context where we start uh, studying it. Since Mark chapter 11, we have been in what is known as Holy Week, right? The final week of Jesus' life before the cross. And so uh, you can tell that a big portion of Mark just is focused on those last few days. And this story that, that Stacy just read for us is mentioned in uh, the in other Gospels, right? And just, just a quick explanation. There are four books at the start of the New Testament that cover the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And like, uh, and it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are known as the four Gospels of Jesus. And like all books in the Bible, they were inspired by God, but also had human authors, uh, whose names were, shockingly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Uh, and each author had unique goals, right? They had unique audiences and themes in mind. And in each gospel, there were things that Jesus did that they left out. They just didn't mention. In fact, John gives us an explanation for this. In John 21, he says, There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if every one of them were written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. All right? And so that's John's confession, like, I couldn't have possibly included everything for you. And so it means the details and the stories and narratives that they have included fit their purpose and fit their theme. And this event highlights the differences that we find in the four Gospels, right? There were two times that Jesus was anointed that we know of because we read in the Gospels. Once was in Galilee at Simon the Pharisee's house a year before this event, right? Luke tells us about that event in Luke chapter 7. The other one is right here in Bethany. And Matthew, Mark, and John all write about the anointing at Bethany. Right? They don't mention the one in Galilee. And so each of them include, Matthew, Mark, and, and John, even though they are telling about the same story, they each include different angles and different details, even to the point where it seems like some things might even be off, right? And those differences are easily reconciled. Um, and I, it's Family Worship Sunday, so I don't want to spend 20 minutes on that, right? But if you have questions, ask me after. But John gets all kinds of credit for being a master storyteller, And it's rightfully so because his, more than any other, his gospel is almost laid out like a novel. And we will reference a lot of details that John includes from this anointing at Bethany this morning. But Mark wasn't as gifted a writer in that way. He's more uh, short, simple, to the point, much like James later in the New Testament, right? But his writing in this chapter, specifically the first part of of Mark 14, is dramatic and it's brilliant. This is the, I think just from a, from a narrative perspective, this is the greatest writing he has in his gospel because the way that he lays out this chapter, he is letting his readers know that this, Mark believes this was a significant turning point in the story, right? That this event not only prepared Jesus for his burial, but also served as a major factor in why Jesus died when he died, and he sets that up for us, right? He gets your mind thinking about it with, by the way he sets up the chapter in, in verses 1 and 2. So look again with me at that. He says, it's two days before the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so that there won't be a riot among the people. And so we can see there, Mark is establishing that danger is looming for Jesus, Right? And there's the first example of how things are intensifying. We've, if you've been with us uh, in our study of Mark these past couple years, you know that the religious leaders have never been fans of Jesus, right? They've wanted to harass him. They've wanted to belittle him. They've wanted to erase his popularity. They've wanted to arrest him. They've wanted to make his life difficult. But verse 1 of chapter 14, Mark has made it clear for us now. They want more than that now. They want him dead. They want him gone. They've decided that their lives would be better if he is no longer on earth. And they're settled in their hearts on that. But in their minds, you can see their strategy. In verse 2, they say, all right, let's let's at least have the patience to wait out the festival. Because it's Passover week. It's the festival of unleavened bread, right? Jerusalem is slammed with all the people who've come in for that festival. Uh, Jesus is quite popular. And so what they don't need is a riot on their hands. Right? They don't need this to be a big public show. They don't need a lot of attention on it. They just want him secret. They, Mark tells us they're looking for a cunning way to arrest him, get him out of here in secret and kill him. 
And they just don't see how that's possible in a city that that's crowded. And so they're like, well, let's just, let's just wait the festival out and we'll try again later. There's just one problem with that. If you have Mark open, look with me. Turn back a couple pages to chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses, I'm going to start reading verse 33. And again, the whole back half of Mark focuses on one week. So this is just a few days before this. And it's when Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem with his disciples. And this is what he says in Mark 10, verse 33. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and he will rise after three days. Okay, you can turn back to Mark 14. The reason I read that is this, is that Jesus already knows. He knew in advance he's dying this week. This is all happening this week. His father has set the time in advance. Jesus is aware of it. But we find at the start of the chapter, those who want this to happen, right, who will be willing partners in God's plan, aren't willing to make the move because they're afraid of the crowds. And so what they need is assistance. What they need is an opportunity that they couldn't create on their own. And that's when Mark begins to tell us about this banquet in Bethany. And he wants us to connect the dots. In verse 3, Mark tells us that Jesus is at a dinner in Bethany, and John has some interesting details that let us know why the religious leaders have firmly decided that Jesus must die. Because while Jesus was in Bethany, he did an interesting thing. He did something that they could never refute. Jesus' friend Lazarus had been dead and buried for four days, and Jesus showed up and rose Lazarus from the dead. Now, I know I gave that to you as just context and background story, but please don't skip over that part. Jesus Christ has power over the grave. That is the hope that defines our faith. And after this event, John tells us in his gospel, says this, Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw, that he, and saw what he did believed in him. That's believed in Jesus. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and were saying, What are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And so from that day on, they plotted to kill him. That was the last miracle Jesus did, right, before the cross. It was the one that decided, that made his enemies firm in the idea, he's got to go. And so his enemies have decided, we can't beat him, we can't stop him. If we let him go on, everyone's going to believe in him. He must die. But back at Bethany, a whole different scene is playing out where Jesus is receiving great honor. Now, it's not by accident that these differing reactions are recorded by Mark. He wants us to note the contrast, right? In Jerusalem, they are plotting his death. Just outside the city in Bethany, they're throwing a banquet in his honor. And while the dinner is happening, a woman approaches Jesus. And it was common practice in that day, uh, Jewish festive meals for guests, especially guests of honors, uh, that they would be anointed, right? With a couple small drops of oil put on their head to show them honor. Uh, and, but this woman does not do that, right? Instead, she approaches Jesus with an entire jar, a full body of very expensive perfume and nard, which is oil uh, from India that was very expensive and smelled great. And instead of using the top dropper so it would just drop out, she, she shatters it. She breaks it at the neck of the bottle so she has a larger hole, and she pours the entire bottle out on Jesus' head. And John tells us she also goes from there and then anoint Jesus' feet, which, by the way, he's reclining at the table, and so it would have been very easy to do both. And she just dumps this entire thing out, signifying that he's worthy of so much more than just a couple drops of oil. And she dries his feet with her hair, an act of humble submission, and she's declaring him as worthy of her honor, worthy of her service, worthy of her worship and her everything. This is more than just an act of humility in front of this entire banquet. It's more than just giving him honor by this physical act alone. This was also incredibly costly for this woman. Verse 5, the CSB tells us that this bottle is worth more than 300 denarii. Now that figure might not mean much to you. Okay, because you don't know what denarii are, you don't know the translation, but here's what it means, right? It, it, it equated to a full year's salary for a laborer in that day. And so this was incredibly expensive perfume, and she just poured all of it out in a moment on Jesus. Now, Mark does not identify this one for us. 
because he has his own reasons for that. John tells us who it is, though, and he tells us this is Mary, which makes total sense for two reasons, right? Number one, Mary is Lazarus' sister, and so Jesus has just done something miraculously wonderful for her family, and so she's expressing her praise and gratitude. But number two, this is who Mary always was. Right? There are three times that we read about Mary in the Gospels, and each time we find her at the exact same place. In Luke 10, Jesus is at their house before Lazarus dies, and he's teaching, and her sister Martha is serving everyone and running around, but we're told that Mary is one place. She is at Jesus' feet, listening intently to every word he says. In John 11, Jesus shows up at the house again, but this time after Lazarus has died. And in her grief, in her questions, Mary runs and she falls at the feet of Jesus. And then in Mark 14 and John 12, we find Mary at the feet of Jesus once more anointing him. And this act of worship was, was unable to be ignored. Right? Mary's quite intentional here. She did this at a point in which as many people as possible would see it. Not to draw attention to herself, but because she wanted Jesus to receive the public adoration that he, she believed he deserved. And this act by Mary would have interrupted the banquet, right? Every other conversation would have stopped. They would all be looking at what she is doing, right? And it would have commanded the room because John writes that the house, the entire house, was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So think of all the senses as a scene. They would have seen what Mary was doing with their eyes. They would have heard the bottle breaking. They would have smelled the perfume as he was anointed. This was, it was impossible to ignore But even though they were in Bethany and not in Jerusalem, even though they were at a meal with friends and not with religious leaders, even though uh, they are around, uh, even though Jesus is being honored and not plotted to kill him, this act wasn't praised by everyone who was there. Because it wasn't as moving to everyone as it should have been. Not everybody there was a fan of this. In fact, listen to this critique in verse 4. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they began to scold her. right? This is too much. What a waste. Okay, well, I mean, how, how foolish of this woman to jump all that out on Jesus, right? What about the poor? We always have the poor to worry about, right? And, and this bottle was a resource. It was valuable. And if you didn't want it anymore, the least you could have done is sold it. And then we could, as the ministry of Jesus, we could do more with it, do some good with it. But just to dump it out like that, what a silly act. Now, there's a couple things that we need to realize here. And the first is a sad truth, but I need to share it with you because it's still a truth. Whenever you show God the level of devotion and worship and sacrifice that he deserves, you are always, always, always going to have detractors. Every time. If you give sacrificially, if you st- take a step of obedience that requires what, what others would consider great faith, if you give the Lord the fullness of your devotion and your passion, there will always be somebody going, geez, that's too much. What a waste, right? God wants you to be a wise steward too. Why don't you dial it back a little? I've never witnessed in my entire life someone going into the ministry or the mission field. I've never witnessed someone living in full reliance on God or someone give generously or someone give up something like a smartphone or sports or even a career for God without being criticized or questioned or belittled. And what's worse, it's most often Christians who are the detractors. As if there could ever be an act of worship too big. As if there could ever be a sacrifice that God is not worthy of. As if there could ever be a step of faith that he would not be moved by and come through for you. As if there could ever be a level of devotion that Jesus is not worthy of. Which is why whenever someone criticizes your level of faith or devotion or obedience, it actually says more about them than you or the God you worship. There's no different back in Bethany. Because John gives us a detail that Mark leaves out at least for a few verses. And John tells us who among the detractors was leading the charge. And it was Judas. And he was the one most defended by the waste. He was the spokesperson for those who thought that Mary went too far and wasted all this resource and that money could have been used for the poor. But listen to this detail that we're told about him in John 12. John 12, verse 6. He, Judas, didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag It would steal part of what was put in. Now, Jesus, of course, is fully aware of this. But that's not the reason he defended Mary. 
He defended her because she was right. He defended her because he is worthy of whatever level of devotion and praise and sacrifice we give him and more. And this is the second time, actually, in the Gospels that Mary is criticized and questioned and scolded publicly for her devotion to Jesus. And both times Jesus speaks up and defends her. To Martha, he says, Mary, Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will never be taken from her. To Judas, he looks at him, at him and says, what, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the entire world, what she has done for me will be told in memory of her. By the way, we're fulfilling Jesus' prophecy right now by talking about that. Now, you might think, well, that's a nice little bow to put in the story. Mary shows her devotion for Jesus. Judas and others showcase their objection. Jesus speaks up and defends Mary. Nobody's going to question Jesus in that room, right? It's settled and it's over, but not really. Because the story doesn't end there in Bethany. It takes a really dark turn. And do you remember how Mark set this whole thing up for us? What he told us in verses 1 and 2, that the religious leaders have decided they want Jesus dead, but they have to wait. They don't want to wait. They have to wait because they see no way to arrest him in secret during the festival. Well, look what happens next. Mark chapter 14, verse 10. Mark writes, then Judas, that then is doing a lot of work there. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. I want you to see how absolutely heartbreaking the language is there. Did you notice it? Jesus went to the chief priests, or Judas went to the chief priests. They didn't reach out to him. They didn't entice him. They didn't have to talk him into it. This was his idea. It was his idea alone. And now he presents them with a gift that they couldn't have come up with on their own. He's willing to betray Jesus. One of Jesus' own followers is willing to betray Jesus, to lead them to a secret, quiet place where he can be arrested, and they can seize Jesus without fear of the crowds, and they are beyond pleased. Right, they're thrilled with this. They can't believe this opportunity has fallen in their laps because they can seize and kill this man they hate so much sooner than they thought possible. And it's all because one of Jesus' own followers, his own disciples, has completely turned his back on him. Has completely betrayed him and determined to lead his enemy secretly to him. Now, I, I, I think Mark is trying to show us a couple things here clearly by tying these stories together and making sure you realize they, they, they one led to the other. And it's where I want us to focus as we close. And the first is this, that there is no act of worship or sacrifice too big for Jesus. Here's the reality this morning. Whatever it is you or I are willing to give Jesus... Whatever it is we're willing to give up for Jesus, whatever it is we're willing to sacrifice for Jesus, however it is we're willing to obey him, right? Whatever love or devotion or worship that we want to give him, he deserves more than it. More than whatever we've given him, right? More than what we're willing to give him. He deserves everything. And there are times in the Gospels in which Jesus was moved by and marveled at people and even praised them. And they all were the same thing. And it was never, listen to me, it was never when they showed wisdom it was never when they showed logic. It was never when they showed reason. It was never when they mastered responsibility, right? Every single time it was when they showed great faith in him. From the widow who gave all that she had to live on to the Roman centurion who told Jesus, no, don't come to my house. Just say the word and it will be done. To Jairus who still brought Jesus to his house after being told his little girl was already dead, right? To Mary pouring out an entire year's salary onto his head and his feet. He is most honored and most revered and most praised when we actually trust him more than anything else in our life. I promise you, I, I promise you this, okay, and I mean this, there will never come a time and when God looks at us and says, oh, come on, man, be more reasonable. I mean, I want you to trust me, but that much, really? Like, now I've got to go to work to come through for you, and this is an obligation. God will never, ever, ever say that to us. But I wonder how many times, probably in this room alone, countless times, he looked at me and you with the same sadness that he looked at the rich young ruler when he walked away. Thinking, man, you, you could have had the adventure of a lifetime. You could have seen things that, with me that you wouldn't have seen anywhere else. You could have experienced my power and your life in ways that you never will otherwise. But you trusted safety. 
and you trusted security, and you trusted finances, and you trusted the comfort of knowing everyone, and you trusted familiarity, and you trusted family, and you trusted friends, you trusted all of that more than me. And I would love to say to you that I want to see more big acts of faith from those who call Valley home, but I don't even like that language because I don't think they're big acts of faith. When you realize the power and the glory and the capability and strength and love and care of Jesus, you start to realize what he meant when he said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Whatever level of faith and trust and sacrifice and love and devotion that you and I are giving Jesus right now, one thing is sure, he's worthy of more. And so may we as a church always be striving to give him more of it. The second thing I believe Mark is trying to show us here is that little choices add up to become big choices. Because in this one small section of Mark, we, we see a variety of reactions to Jesus. He is admired by the crowds. He is loved dearly by Martha and Mary and their family. He's, he's followed by his disciples. He's betrayed by Jesus, he, Judas. He's hated by the religious leaders. And you know what's crazy? It's all the same Jesus. He's not any different. But all these variety of responses to him are different, which is why our response to Jesus says a lot about us. And Mark is trying to lay out for us two very divergent paths here. We're introduced to Mary in the, in the Bible in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus is teaching, and there's a lot Mary could have been busied with or worried about. Instead, she just sits at his feet, intently listening to every word that he says. She's declaring that Jesus and his word is the priority of her life. And from there, we find her here in Mark 14, worshiping him so publicly and extravagantly. And she didn't get to that level of devotion in an instant. She didn't even get there by Jesus doing a miracle for her family. She got there because years before she made the determination that he was first place in her life. And this is simply the destination that the road that she has been traveling has led her. From here, she's going to be able to see the resurrection. She's going to witness the start of the church. And she is now in heaven experiencing the fullness of being with the Jesus that she cared so much about. Judas, we are told, was put in charge of the treasury. And at some point in this whole ordeal, he decided that he should have some of it. And he helped himself to it. And then nothing really happened. He stayed a disciple of Jesus. There were no earth-shattering consequences. He didn't get taught. Nothing really changed. And so he did it again. And then he did it again. And then he did it again, and each time he seemingly got away with it. But what he failed to realize is that he had gotten on a train that was headed only one direction. And eventually, your heart belonging to something other than Jesus will always ruin you. That's what idols do. They ruin you. For Judas, his love of money blinded his ability to even see Mary's devotion. His greed saw things only in coins and possibilities. And if that was sold, how much more could he have pocketed? And then for Jesus to correct him in front of everyone, even when he played the poor card, how dare he? And so he knew where he could go. And he betrayed the Son of God. He betrayed the one who chose him as a disciple when so many others would have wanted that honor. And he, and he betrayed him know, knowing all along that Jesus was the one who loved him and served him and honored him, knowing all along what Judas would do. And how could Judas do such a thing? It's, we're told they offered him money. That's how. They offered him the one thing that meant more to Judas than Jesus. And it all began when he reached his hand in the bag the first time. It was one time in Berlin that I had a whole team get on a train with me, and I wasn't sure it was right. And to my dismay, when they announced the next station, I realized we were going in the wrong way. And so you know what we did? We got off the train, and we waited for the next one coming the right direction. And it's true that our co the collection of our choices are sending us in a direction, right? Some of them in a direction that we don't want to go. But for all of us, God gives us the gifts of confession and repentance. To confess that we've made a bad decision, that we have misplaced priorities, that we are headed down the wrong path. And repentance, that word simply means just turning around. Instead of staying on that path, just 
change directions. And I have a simple question for you this morning, but I want you and I to feel the full weight of it. Where do you need to turn around? What are you chasing? What are, pursuing, what are you pursuing? What direction are you headed? That if you actually followed that path to its furthest conclusion would not be where you want to go. Do yourself a favor. Catch a trend before it becomes a disaster in your life. And turn around. And I want you all to know really clearly, there's a giant reason that we can do this. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went and died on a cross, and he did so to pay the price for the sins and the failings of any who would believe in him, which means it doesn't matter your past, it doesn't matter how far you've gone from God, it doesn't matter how bad things are gotten, every single one of us can turn around to the grace and forgiveness and love of Jesus. Because there's nothing you've ever done that is more powerful and more compelling or more impactful than God's Son dying on the cross for you. And so whether you are a follower of Jesus who needs to turn from a path that's not the best for you or whether you're turning to God for the first time, that gift has been made available to every single one of us today in Christ Jesus. Now the idea that little choices add up to become big choices is something that we can actually leverage to our advantage. It doesn't have to be a tragic story like Judas. It can be a successful story like Mary's. And so we want to close with this. What little choices can you make to help you love and serve Jesus more? Ward Kimball was an animator for the Disney company. Uh, He worked on the Snow White movie, and once he spent 240 days drawing a scene, animating a scene, in which the dwarfs made soup for Snow White and almost destroyed the kitchen in the process. 240 days he worked on this scene. It ended up being four and a half minutes long. They showed the movie, the final cut, to Walt Disney, who thought the scene was really funny, but he decided it stopped the flow of the story, and so he cut it. It was never shown to audiences. At the end of our lives, we'll have written a story, and whether our story will be great as it could have been will depend heavily on our willingness and ability to cut out a lot of good things in order to make room for the great things that God wanted to do in us and through us. And so one of the best questions that we can ask ourselves is this. We can ask ourselves questions we don't ask enough. What is taking up way more of my time than it deserves? What is taking up way more of my money and resources than it deserves? What is robbing my devotion and attention away from Jesus? What is keeping me from serving him and others as I should? What is causing me to think only about myself all the time? What would God say is the greatest hindrance in my life to hearing from him and being shaped by him? And would you like to change that trend today? What's something that you could give up, something you could do less of, something you could sacrifice, something that you could remove from your life, something that if you did, you actually made that small decision now, 20 years from now, your life and your family's life and so many others' lives could be impacted by what God did through you. And then ask, what's something that I could add to my life that, would, that could help me love him more? Whether it's a reading plan to help you be in his word, a set-aside time for prayer and solitude with him in your day non-believers in your life to pray for and share the gospel with, a role of service to your church or his kingdom, trusting him with your finances by giving, asking for his help and forgiving someone that you haven't forgiven yet, apologizing to someone that you, you really should apologize to, some intentional step of pursuit to your king. And what I'm telling you is it doesn't have to be massive right now. It just has to put you on the path. And if you stayed on that path for days and weeks and months and years to come, where might he take you? So I wanted to lead us into a time of response now. And I'm praying that you're going to genuinely wrestle with these questions. We're going to put some on the screens for you. That all over the room, people will be committing to giving up and surrender things to Jesus. And people will be committing to add intentional steps of worship and pursuit and obedience. Because remember, whatever it is, whatever you decide this morning, whatever you commit to giving him, he deserves even more. So this is your time with him.